excellent. Thank excellent. You. Okay, you guys ready? Um, welcome and thank you for joining us on this beautiful day in June. I hope it's as beautiful where you are as it is where I'm at here on the central coast of California. And especially for recognizing the importance of the conversation we're about to have. Happy Pride Month. I'm Emily Smith, co-creator of Touchstone Central Coast, and Diane and I really want you to participate and ask questions. We're all learning together. We, we recognize that words matter, and we are often afraid to ask questions because we're afraid of saying the wrong thing or using the wrong terminology or vocabulary that represents our friends in the LGBTQ plus community. You are in a safe place and with people who want to engage and answer your questions. And there are no bad questions when delivered with love and respect. We are in a webinar format, so please use the chat and we'll address your questions as they come up. We're gonna divide the session today in three se sections. Um, education, vocabulary, best practice, understanding. Um, there's going to be discussion around history of Pride Month and then also Pacific Pride Foundation Summer of Pride activities. And then throughout, as I said, as questions come up, we'll um, address the, the questions. Uh, Marsha P. Johnson asked the question, how many years has it taken people to realize that we are all brothers and sisters and human beings in the human race? And Harvey Milk tells us that hope will never be silent. Today, we are so fortunate to have with us and to help us navigate this conversation, um, our friends from the Santa Barbara County Pacific Pride Foundation. We have Executive Director Kristen Flickinger, we have the new Director of Development, Tyson Halsep, and we just learned the new Program Manager, Tiffany or TJ Lane. So I would love to start um, with the three of you talking a little bit about your personal journey to the Pacific, Pacific Pride Foundation. And why don't we start with Kristen, followed by TJ and then Tyson. You guys just jump in when, whenever you'd like. And again, welcome. We're so glad to have you here and take it away, Kristen. So thanks so much. We're really excited to be here. Uh, Pacific Pride Foundation has been an important part of the Santa Barbara community for the past 45 years. Uh, I'm new to the organization, just under a year as exec executive director, but I'm not new to LGBT work or um, you know, the LGBTQ plus movement. It is worth saying, because I've used two different acronyms, that as we talk today, my guess is we will use a whole bunch of terms somewhat interchangeably. Uh, things are changing on an ongoing basis. Uh, right, right now, we use LGBTQ plus most of the time. That's an inclusive term that, especially in uh, the U.S., is used to represent the community. Some people will say LGBT. Some people will say queer. Um, that's generationally kind of it depends on who's using words, but I will use a bunch of words today. If you have questions, happy to talk about them. If you have questions for you or an organization you wanna bring us in to do an education session, happy to do that too. All right, so also worth noting that I will be speaking today from my own standpoint with my own experiences. I am a sample size of one. I don't speak for the community, although I have experience in the community. I identify as a cis, which means non-trans, so cis, white, lesbian, uh, and that's what my experience is we'll be speaking to today. So, all right, I come from uh, the mountains of Idaho. I grew up as a queer kid in Idaho, uh, one of not a lot, as you might imagine. Uh, went to college in Oregon where I stayed for a long time, got my law degree and, and uh, went to work for the campaigns in the early 2000s. And I had spent some time in Washington DC working as an intern for the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. At the time, that's what it was called. It's now the National LGBTQ Task Force, I believe. Everybody changing, updating all the time. Um, I worked for a number of years as a professional gay or a pro-lesbo, as I like to, to call it. Um, uh, went to do a fundraising, learned how to fundraise with some national organizations. 
And then uh, I had a whole odyssey, traveled the world, came back, landed in LA, did some production work and applied for a job with the world's largest LGBT organization, the Los Angeles LGBT Center. Worked there for seven years, both as the director of AIDS life cycle for the center. So that's the big AIDS ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And in my time there, um, I was in charge of raising $25 million for HIV services at the, at the center. And then I moved into a director of programs position where I worked to open up a multi-generational, intergenerational housing complex, as well as uh, drop-in centers for LGBT youth and LGBT seniors, one of the first of its kind anywhere. Um, I've been doing the work for a while. I learn every single day. I am an expert in tiny little areas, and then I know some stuff about some other stuff. So I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be in community, to be in conversation. Um, you know, I came to Pacific Pride recently in the middle of a pandemic uh, as a new ED. It has been an incredible ride. Uh, there are incredible people in this community and on this staff that have done incredible work for many, many years. And we look forward to many, many years. Fantastic. Tyson, how did you come to PPF? Hey everyone. Uh, so I have been involved with Pacific Pride for the greater part of my adult life. Um, I started volunteering with PPF when I was in college and with, uh, I think it was the AIDS walk. That was the first event I volunteered with. And then when I graduated from UCSB, um, I got a job there as the part-time programs assistant. At the time, I didn't really know what that meant. Um, I was in that role for a couple of months and then moved into uh, the development department as development associate and then quickly became our development and events manager. So I spent four years in that role running our major events. So our AIDS walk, our pride festival, the time we used to do a big golf tournament, holiday party. Um, and then as we were starting to start up our Royal Ball Gala, which is now a huge event and fundraiser for PPF, that was about the time I left the organization to go in a different direction. Um, and then a couple years later, I came back and joined the board of directors and have served on the board for the last four years as our board secretary and advancement chair. And as of two weeks ago, I am now back on the staff of Pacific Pride as our development director. So really excited to be here, excited to be working with Kristen. Um, you know, as we climb out of this challenging year that we've had, there's so much work to do and so much rebuilding. And I think having Kristen um, at the helm of this and now having Tiffany on board, I think we're just all really excited to get in there and, and just build out the next chapter of PPF, so. Fantastic. That's my story. <laughs> Great. Tiffany, share your uh, journey to PPF. Um, so a lot of my career has actually been in higher education. Um, from when I first got into my student activism at Michigan State University, where I went for undergrad, um, I really admired the director at the time and wanted to do his job. I was, And I would actually joke that I'd take his job. I never did that. But <laughs> I was fortunate enough to finally make it to be a director um, at two private liberal arts colleges, the last one being Colgate University in Hamilton, New York. Um, but the other thing that I really enjoyed doing was just giving back to the community. So whether that was in a board member um, position or just doing volunteer work in the community was something that um, I always try to do in places I lived. And then the last maybe few years, um, I really wanted to expand on that and actually journey into that being a job. So I... Um, went back to school and I'm continuing school um, to learn more about the nonprofit sector. And then I decided why not find a job? And so that's when PPF popped up. Um, at the time I wasn't looking to move to California. I just put my hat in there and just to see what happened. And lo and behold, Kristen liked me <laughs> and offered me the job as a program manager. Um, and it's been great. Um, it's been a great learning curve for me in terms of learning harm reduction uh, strategies and getting to work with youth, which has always been a passion of mine. Um, and just being in California, um, which a lot of people were very much about the nostalgia of California. I was just excited to have the job. Um, so that's how I got here. Um, but I've always wanted to just direct an office and I've been fortunate enough to be able to do that and working with youth specifically because um, I'm very much about working on the ground and helping people because um, someone helps me find my voice and uh, actually find my leadership skills. And so um, to be able to be in a career where I can give back is very, um, it's, it's just a passion of mine and I love what I do. And so to be able to do that at a community level 
Um, and I'm learning so much and um, it's just been a great journey and I've only been in the job a couple months, but um, I can't wait to see what I can bring to each of our programs and all the great work I'll do with Tyson and Kristen and the staff that I have. And so I just really feel very thankful that I was able to get the opportunity to um, take my career to another level. That's so great. Again, we're so, so thankful to be able to share this time with the three of you. Um, I know that you have an agenda. We talked about that a little bit at the beginning. So we're going to just turn it over to the three of you and you take it away. You know, you know what you got going on and we can't wait. Great. Thanks, Tiffany. I think you are up first. I am. So uh, one of the many parts of my job is um, uh, providing, make your trainings and presentations. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about just kind of like a quip synapse of like how folks can be more inclusive and supporting of the community. Um, what I like to, I like people to leave with knowing that there are little baby steps you can take. And then the, the important thing is to continue to educate yourself. It's not a one and done thing is what I like to say in trainings. And so one of the, like one of the first basic steps you can do is just really learning basic terms and concepts. So like learning what, um, what it means to be a lesbian, what it means to be gay, trans, cisgendered, which cisgendered just as an example is um, someone who subscribes to the gender that they were given at birth. So for me, I was, when I was born in March, <laughs> the doctor said, it's a girl and I identify as a cisgendered female. Learning what gender identity is, which is how you identify, not how, how someone thinks you should identify, and then your gender expression. So how you present your gender. So for me, um, and I'm probably going to use, use myself in examples a lot during this, um, it's about what well, I present myself in a very masculine way. I show up in what we would call masculine, like shirts, pants, the shoes, all that. Um, some would even say I have a masculine haircut, but that's what makes me comfortable. And so that's how I show up in the world. Um, and it's really important to understand that it's how, what makes you comfortable and not what other people think you should show up as, because we love to put people in boxes for the sake of putting people, the people who are uncomfortable. It's not about, um, the people who are making uncomfortable. So when we put people in boxes, we like to, um, we're neglecting to realize that we're making the person that we're boxing in uncomfortable. And so we really need to do a better job. And we've made strides with this to really unpack that and to stop doing that. It, people should feel free to be who they are. But even with 2021, we still have a lot of work to do in terms of changing that. It's also really important to understand um, the importance of creating inclusive environments, whether it be your uh, a nonprofit, your personal office, your home, you know, just showing people that this is a space people can come and be themselves. And there's many ways you could do that. You could do that through a visual display of inclusion. So a typical one would be like a rainbow flag or some people have um, displays of gay icons that they really enjoy uh, or they admire or um, in, an, in, an, in office buildings, you could have like display your dis non-discrimination statement to show people that everyone is welcome here and you won't tolerate X, Y, and Z. Um, when you think of nonprofits, you know, having brochures, resources that are from LGBT organizations, um, having media such as magazines, or even including something in your newsletter as a way of showing the community that you're supportive is also really important. But I want to stress that when you do that, you're also saying you're a safe person, a safe place, and that you do address any sort of anti-LGBT things that happen in the workplace or happen in um, your organization. Because if you're not doing that, you run the risk of essentially pushing that community away um, and they might not come back to your organization or your corporations and whatnot. So um, if you're going to display those sort of things, you really need to also make sure you are addressing when things come up in your place of, in, your place of employment or in your environment. Um, one thing that people really get, um, really wanna know more about is pronouns. And so what they are, there are parts of speech, they substitute nouns or and noun prophases, uh, phrases. So an uh, example of pronouns would be he, she, her, they, them, theirs, or z, zim, zeers, or some people just go by their name. Um, and people ask me all the time, like, how do I bring it up? Well, <laughs> what you can do is when you introduce yourself. So if I say I'm Tiffany Lane, I go by she, her, hers, I'm starting the conversation and not putting the onus on someone else. You can also put it in your email signature. Um, depending on what kind of system you use for collecting data, you can also include it there because it's really important that um, 
we're not putting it on the trans and non-binary community to always have to say their pronouns or always have to identify themselves, but also understanding too, that some people aren't there yet in terms of what feels comfortable to them. So they might just say, just call me Mike, just call me Christian, just call me David and reflect that. So whatever language or name they're using, that's what you should be using too. Don't say, well, are you sure? Nope, that's who they are. So don't second guess that. That's not okay. That's disrespectful. Um, and, it and it's a way of saying like, oh, you're not important enough. You're not visible enough for me to care about your identity. At the end of the day, when it comes to the name people want to go by and the pronouns they go by, it's about respecting them. It's about seeing them and it's about respecting their identity. So you really have to make sure that you are doing that. And if you're not, you know, hold yourself accountable or other people accountable and like address that too, because if you don't address that, again, you run the risk of isolating an entire community and you don't want to do that. Um, in addition to, oh, you can also have pronouns on if you have a name badge or I know during conferences, this has been pretty big. They have, um, I've been to conferences where they have like pronoun buttons. Uh, Task Force actually did this, does this a lot. So that's also another thing you could do, put it in, on your business card. There's plenty of ways you can um, show that you respect identity and also show your identity. But I also encourage people to go beyond that. So looking at, you know, policies, looking at hiring practices, um, pronouns or reflecting identity is great, but you really need to go above and beyond that if you're going to really be an ally and really be inclusive of the community. A couple other things I would say too is just avoid assumptions in general. Get to know the person. We're all like it's a blank slate. Just get to know their name, their hobbies, what they do for a living, what sports they like to play or watch, or if they like to knit or have two cats. It doesn't matter, but just get to know the person. Don't place judgment on them based on what you see, because a lot of what you see is not the truth. So you really got to like just take the time and get to know the person. I would also say, um, again, use pronouns and the names that they go by. And even if they went by she, her one day and he, him the next day, that's fine too. That's what's comfortable for the person. So don't say, didn't you just go by she, her yesterday? Maybe they did. But again, it's what feels good to them in the moment. So respect that. And you, again, reflect the language that they use at that time. Actions speak louder than words. And I say this a lot to people because it's not enough to have a flag or a mug or a statement. If you're not backing that up with action, if you're actually not doing anything to address anti-LGBT things in your workplace or in your home, then you really can't call yourself an ally. Um, anyone can put up a rainbow sticker. Anyone can sell anything that's rainbow, but if you're not doing things to make sure the, comp the, the community feels safe, feels welcome and affirmed, then you have a bigger problem. So if you're going to say you're an ally, you need to do the work as an ally and it's messy and sometimes it's not fun, but social justice work is messy. Sometimes it's not fun, but it's work. So you really got to do it and do it authentically, not for performative actions and not for likes on Instagram. Do it because you want to make this world a better place for the next generation. Um, lastly, again, holding yourselves accountable. We all make mistakes. I make mistakes and this is my career. So don't get stuck in the woe is me. I'll never get it right again. No, just dust yourself off, apologize and do better next time and pledge to do better next time. Um, trainings, education, 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 education is super important. So if you can go to a webinar, a seminar, a conference session, bring in speakers like us or trainings and we can do trainings too. If you want to know more about that, um, Tiffany at PacificPrideFoundation.org. You can email me and I can tell you more about trainings. We're happy to come and do that. So as long as you're like trying to um, keep up to date with the latest issues that impact the community, how you can, your organization should do more, just make sure, thank you, Kristen, just make sure that you are looking for those resources. And there's magazines, there's books, the World Wide Web has everything out there. There's a lot of information that you, you can use to uh, educate yourself. So please do utilize it. And also just being aware of local and regional resources, even national resources. Um, I think the one of the good things that came out of the pandemic is we can reach people virtually. So if you want to bring this really big speaker, but the flight's going to cost a lot of money, you probably could do something virtually with them um, to educate you on, you know, the latest trans policies that need to be in place. Or how can I make sure that um, at a corporate level, we're being inclusive? Or what are some hiring practices we need to know? And how, how can I bring in this consultant who does X, Y, and Z. So um, really finding out the resources and letting people know where they are is also really important. And that's my spiel. Tiffany, I have a, I have a question and, and Tyson, yeah. Kristen, feel free to jump in there. But um, 
I, I know you hit on this a little bit, but um, I would love some help and elaboration regarding um, how and what kinds of questions are good questions to ask. Because sometimes we don't know how to say what we what we are curious mm -hmm. about and what we're trying to gain understanding. And I'm wondering if there's some some things that you can kind of guide our questioning um, with. Yes. Um, so I would say um, a good question is asking someone how you can support them. Um, if someone comes out to you, you could say, you know, well, when did you know? Or um, are there any resources I can get for you? Like stuff like that. Like questions that are about helping the person. Don't ask people, are you sure you're gay? Are you sure you're trans? Mm -hmm. Don't ever ask someone about their, if, especially this is more for trans and non-binary con community. Don't ask them about what's under the hood, so to speak. Um, this is something that does get asked specifically. This has happened when trans and non-binary folks have been stopped with, by the cops. So you wanna ask supportive questions. Um, does anyone else know that you're out? If not, and most likely someone might not have come out to other people, you have to respect that too. So just asking respectful questions about how you can be supportive is really important. Or how they, or in terms of identity, how would you like to meet me to address you? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, uh, I will second all of that. You know, the questions about, um, are you okay? Like, how are you, how are you doing? Who else knows so that I can make sure that I'm keeping you safe? Um, these are really good questions to ask. If you're coming, um, I would say come at, come to people with a curiosity about them as human beings. Like I said, find out, you know, which one of us do you think has two cats and which one of us knits? You'd probably be totally surprised. Um, that's a more interesting conversation than have you had surgery? And I would caution, if you're feeling curiosity, steer away. Don't ask that question. Mm -hmm. Google it. There's a lot of information on the internet and no LGBTQ person owes anybody else their story. So you might like to know someone's story, but you're not owed anybody's story. And that story can be very personal. It can be triggering. It can be empowering. It can be beautiful. If someone chooses to share it with you, fantastic. Treat it as a, a, a solemn gift. If they don't, it's not that they don't like you. It's not that they don't feel safe with you. It's just they're making that decision. So I would say steer away from curiosity, go to the internet, and then just get to know people. You can say, hey, tell me about yourself. I'd love to know about your background. If they want to share, they will. Thank you. I appreciate sure. that. You can also ask permission. That's always a great thing. I mean, if, if you, so if you want to make sure that you're getting someone's pronouns right, you can say, hey, you know, what are your pronouns? I want to make sure I get that right. It's okay. People aren't going to be offended. It's okay to ask that question. Mm -hmm. You know? Perfect. All right. Anything else, Tiffany? <laughs> Great, I think I'm up next. So that, that was fantastic. Thank you, Tiffany, for taking through taking us through all those things. And to echo Tiffany, I, this is my job too. I get things wrong every day. I learn things every day. So coming from a place of um, humility and desire to learn gets you a lot. I, I, you know, that's the place to come from. So what I'm going to talk about today is our history of pride. It is Pride Month. In, June is Pride Month generally. In Santa Barbara, we celebrate our Pride Festival typically in August um, for a number of reasons, but everybody, well, largely other people celebrate in June. So I'll talk to you, to you about why that is. Some people probably know about the Stonewall riots. So Stonewall, uh, something people refer to a lot, there was a 50th anniversary of Stonewall riots just a couple of years ago. And the Stonewall riots took place in 1969. So I'm gonna tell you about Stonewall and I'm gonna tell you about everything else because I think the everything else is even more interesting. Stonewall riots happened in 1969 and um, the police raided a gay bar. Gay bar owned by the mafia, by the way, because at the time it wasn't legal to be gay. So it was dangerous to have these establishments. So oftentimes these were underground clubs uh, run by the mafia, um, not by gay people, which further made it hard for gay people to be safe. Regardless, gay folks, trans folks were at a club the cops came in, they started harassing and, and cleared out the club. Things they used at the time were laws um, around a lot of things, including clothing. So if you were wearing more than two items of clothing of the opposite sex, you could be arrested, you could be made to strip down to prove that you were wearing the appropriate clothing as a harassment me mechanism. This happened for a long time, many, many years. It happened at Stonewall. And that night people had, had enough of it. Um, they, riot broke out, the cops were thrown unceremoniously into the streets and uh, the riot continued throughout the night. 
uh, for weeks after that, the community gathered in the streets and, you know, congregated, uh, you know, fought back against the police and um, eventually community, more community organized from that. A year later, there was a pride, pride parade, the first pride parade um, that happened in New York to celebrate the one year anniversary. And we have had pride parades ever since. So, you know, um, I know for me, I'll show my age, but in the 90s, I got a lot of like, why are you shoving it down our throats? Why do you have to show up like that? Why do people, you know, uh, because, because um, we need to remember where we came from. We need to have a place to celebrate, to be ourselves. And, and pride has been, uh, it's rooted in a history of protest, in history of standing up and saying enough is enough and being our full selves. Uh, and, you know, stripping down if we want to, not because the police have told us to. So Stonewall riots happened, but California has a really rich history before that. The Black Cat protests took place in 1967, two years earlier in Los Angeles. And uh, before that was the Cooper's Donut riots in 19, or 1959. So the Black Cat protest was something similar as a tavern, uh, cops came in, raided. And after that, there were peaceful protests that occurred um, at, at the Black Cat. At the time, uh, before 1969, what was so different about some of these things, especially Stonewall, was that the community up to this point um, through organizations like the Mattachine Society, Daughters of Belitis, you know, these are California-based early LGBTQ plus organizations. They subscribed to, subscribed to this idea of um, mainstreaming, of being palatable, of showing up and protesting in white gloves and suits silently with signs. It's a very, very different thing that started happening uh, in, in the 60s. So in 1959, um, <laughs> there were a group of transgender women who clashed with law enforcement at Cooper's Donuts in, in LA. Um, there was relentless police harassment. They had had enough. They tossed the cops into the street um, and closed down Main Street for a full day. So California has a very, very rich history of protest um, and standing up. LGBT rights with our organizations and, and you know, the protests of the 50s and 60s. I say that um, as a demonstration of some of the hidden history. I mean, usually there's hidden history, right? The people who write history aren't always the people who live the history. And um, there are more, I think, important examples of that. It's nice that you know, California has history. But when we're talking about um, Stonewall, more recently, people have learned to speak about trans people, especially the trans women of color who were there. I love that you started off with a, a quote from Martha P. Johnson, um, Sylvia Rivera, also you know in New York, really instrumental in some of these early you know 1960s and 70s um, organizations and standing up up to uh, police abuse. So it's important if you're going to go Google the history, learn the history, or if you're watching the history, ask questions. Do you see trans people? Do you see women? Do you see people of color? Um, and not just lesbians, but also straight women, because they were really important in some of our founding um, symbols and moments. So, for example, uh, many people think that Harvey Milk was the first elected LGBTQ person or out LGBTQ plus person. Harvey Milk was a very, very important, was also very, very visible. And, but he was elected in 1977. But in 1974, there was a woman, Kathy Kozachenko, who made history in Ann Arbor, Michigan, as the first out elected. She was 21 years old and she was elected to the County Board of Supervisors. Uh, she's almost never mentioned. So it's important, again, for us to really dig into the history and understand who was there. Everybody played an important part. We shouldn't diminish the contributions of our cis male, you know, community members, but we want to make sure that it's balanced with the reality of everyone involved. Additionally, the pride flag is often um, is uh, attributed to Gilbert Baker, who was definitely part of the creation of the pride flag in San Francisco. But there were two other people, Jane McNamara and Lynn Siegerblum. Lynn's an incredible woman. She didn't get credit until 19, or 2018 as one of the three people who hand dyed and hand sewed, the, hand sewed the flag, and in fact came up with the concept of the rainbow. Um, she's only now getting, getting credit all these years later, 40 years later. Um, so just, you know, again, it's hidden history out there and it's exciting stuff to discover when you start reading about it, you see yourself and, and that's important. So that's like ancient history, right? That's why pride exists. Um, pride is not pride for pride's sake, right? And it's not the whole story about LGBTQ um, plus work or rights or, or what it is that we do. 
it, similarly, marriage is not BTQ plus equality. It is very important. Many people think, hey, you got marriage, great. You know, we can close down now. We all go home, everything's fine. Uh, that's wrong. I hope there will be a day when we can close our doors and say, yep, equality achieved, you know, but that's not where we are now. Um, we, marriage is critically important because there are thousands of rights that come along with being married to a person. Everything from, you know, fishing licenses that you can inherit to ensuring that you can stay in the house of the person, you know, that you're married to once they pass, to making sure that you can be in you know, the same room in an elder care facility, like really important things that we don't always think about. So marriage is very important. The ability to get married is very important. But we have been working on a lot of other things for a really long time. Uh, our community has always worked to uplift the parts of the community that are most marginalized. We've always done that when we're at our best. That, you know, has been people who are being beaten down in the streets, people who are, um, are substance users and uh, have addiction issues. Um, HIV, you know, during the AIDS crisis, we pivoted to make sure that folks who were dying of HIV were taken care of. And that was largely uh, straight women and lesbians who were making sure that their brothers were not dying alone. Um, youth suicide is something that we've addressed as a community not long ago. Uh, and, and trans issues today, we see all over the all over the news, what's happening with young trans athletes, as well as the trans murder rate, which is incredibly high. I learned a, a staggering statistic yesterday. I, I've always known that um, of our population of youth experiencing homelessness, 40%, up to 40% identify as LGBTQ, especially in urban areas. That's a stunning number. Mm -hmm. Additionally, 40% of trans youth attempt suicide. That isn't consider suicide, that isn't think about suicide. 4% think there's not a place in this world for me. We at Pacific Pride, you know, we need to ensure that we don't repeat history by leaving certain parts of the community behind. And we work really hard every day to ensure wellness for every part of our community. Um, wellness is the business we are in. Um, we, we do this through a number of services and programs. Uh, one is we have the county's only exchange program. Um, often folks who are definitely left behind are, you know, IV drug users. Um, we don't leave them behind. Our community is overrepresented in the opi opioid epidemic. We are in every community. And when something bad is happening to communities, it's happening at greater rates to LGBTQ plus people almost always. So we are out there with the syringe exchange program, making sure we're distributing the Narcan Narcan, which is an overdose reversing drug, and we save hundreds of lives every year through that drug. We also have youth and older adult programs so that there's social connection for our youth. It's critical to have one trusted adult in your life. If you have that, all the outcomes are better. If you know you can go to someone and you'll be safe. And for our older adults, isolation it is truly um, a life or death situation. So we we have older adult groups. People get together and they have lunch. And that's not just a nice thing, that's a life-saving thing. We also work with HIV impact community members. Uh, we'll be opening back up our testing. We, that's the one thing we had to close down during the pandemic. We're about to reopen our HIV and hep C testing. And then we work on community wellness. And that's what we're doing today, right? This is advocacy and education efforts. It's getting out and talking to folks so that not only are our youth safe when they're in here with us, but they're safe when they apply for a job, they're safe when they go to the doctor, they're safe when they're out in the world. That's the work that we're doing on a constant basis and that we will continue to do. And hopefully we'll do with your help. With that, I'll pass it over to Tyson. Kristen, that was a very impressive history lesson all in 12 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> So it is Pride Month. It is June. It is Pride Month. And unfortunately, as Kristen mentioned at the beginning, um, typically in August is when we hold the Pacific Pride Festival. This is the largest LGBTQ plus gathering on the Central Coast annually. We have about 4,000 attendees. But because of the pandemic um, and not knowing where we would be this summer, we were unable to, um, unable to host that event. But there's still lots we can do to celebrate. And so we've developed a lot of partnerships with local businesses that are doing fundraisers for PPF. And there is literally something for everybody. Um, we have partnered with retail brands, with restaurants, with bars, with fitness studios, um, with a the movie theater. 
So whatever it is, whatever your interests are, there's a way that you can participate in that and also support PPF, but also support local businesses at the same time that have had a challenging year um, as well. So on the retail side, our good friends at Deckers are donating 10% of all of the proceeds that they bring in uh, for the month of June at their retail location out in Goleta. And within Deckers, two of their premier brands, Ugg and Sinook, have partnered with us to create a very colorful, fabulous footwear collection <laughs> with part of the proceeds benefiting PPF. So you can learn more about that on our website um, at pacificpridefoundation.org. Our friends at CVs have also created three limited edition shoe prints. Um, you can purchase those directly on their websites and part of the proceeds goes back to PPF. And with things opening up and wanting to get back out there, socialize with folks, um, our friends at Acme Hospitality um, are, have, so there's six restaurants um, that Acme oversees. So it's the Lark, uh, Lokita, La Paloma Cafe, Santa Barbara Wine Collective, Lucky Penny and Helena Bakery. So at all of those locations during the month of June, um, they all have a pride specialty cocktail. So it's a great opportunity to get your friends together, go out for drinks, go on a date with your significant other, whatever that may be. Uh, it's endless ways to support PPF. Um, if you have a sweet tooth like me, you could head over to Hook and Press. <laughs> they have a specialty donut this month and McConnell's is also doing a special strawberry swirl jam deliciousness thing um, for the month of June. And part of the proceeds from that also goes back to PPF. Um, if you're looking to get back into fitness or if you were already into fitness, uh, Core Power Yoga is offering four free classes. Um, all you have to do is make a donation. You can do that directly through their website to PPF. And in turn, you get to attend one of their classes for free. It's a really cool opportunity. And um, we are planning, we're in the stages right now of planning more events that will take place in July, August, and probably into September, some smaller Pride events, um, probably at you know some local bars in town, some house parties. So we're putting all of that together right now, but you can always follow us for more information on that at our website, pacificpridefoundation.org. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. Um, you can go sign up for our newsletter, which you can do directly on our website. We send out an email about once a week with uh, events going on in the community, but also ways to get involved, updates on our programs and services, like the ones that Kristen and Tiffany were talking about. So um, there's always new things happening. And particularly right now with the world reopening, it feels like there's a lot happening and lots of businesses and organizations that are wanting to partner and do something together and collaborate. So to stay up to date with us, do it at, you know, go to pacificpridefoundation.org, sign up for the newsletter, follow us on social. And of course, uh, one of the most meaningful ways you could support PPF is with a donation. And you can also do that at pacificpridefoundation.org. So lots of things going on and lots more to come. You're making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> That's so beautiful. You get a donut, Emily, after this. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking the McConnell's ice cream. That was like, wow. And and my daughter's, you know, coming and we're heading out to Santa Barbara. So we'll we'll probably be stopping. Um, I wanted I wanted to ask you, the three of you, that you know, there currently there's a lot of uh, laws and legislation that um, has you know, huge impact in affecting um, LGBTQ plus communities. And I'm just um, wondering if you could speak to um, any specific effort that the Pacific Pride Foundation is, you know, any efforts going toward those things. And then as community members, um, is there anything that um, we could do to help support moving those laws in the right direction? Yeah, absolutely. So the biggest thing that's out there right now, I mean, number one, it, it is a, it has been one of the most anti-LGBT times for legislation of the past year um, ever. And people may not know that, but it, at state levels, the anti-trans bills are rampant. Um, so that's just happening, right? It's happening. But the, the federal level, there's the Equality Act. The Equality Act is a great thing. It would do a whole to ensure equality for LGBTQ plus folks. Um, it has passed the House. It's sitting with the Senate. As we all know, the Senate is 50-50, which is challenging um, with one specific Democratic senator who's holding up a lot, a lot of legislation. Um, so 
we so what we do we we're part of a collective of lgbt centers across the country called actually across the world called centerlink centerlink has uh, an advocacy wink of it <laughs> wing of it called action link i will put a link in the comments in a moment um, we work with action link because nonprofits can uh, we can advocate in specific ways action link can advocate in more robust ways. So we send people over to Action Link and they hold great education um, sessions and action days where they'll say, here, go to this link, type in this stuff and it'll go to your senator or it'll go to other senators or they'll, or they'll have um, you know, phone banks where you can work with them to call people in other districts because in California, we're fortunate that we have senators that vote the right way. Uh, in my opinion, um, in other states, not so much. So you could call folks in other places and tell them to please call their their um, legislators. And if you have family elsewhere, have them call. My folks in Idaho, they talk to their legislators now. And that is a powerful thing because there are still legislators that until, I don't know how long ago, probably 10 years ago, there were legislators saying there aren't gay people in my district. It's hard for them to say that now, but you know, they can say, I don't hear from uh, that they want me to vote for the Equality Act. They are hearing 30 to one in opposition to the Equality Act. So um, little things, old school activism, calling, you know, e emailing, these make big, big differences. Thank you. I, uh, I recently watched the interview that Oprah did with Elliot Page. And that was really enlightening for me because, you know, she talked about the fact that 80% of people have no, no knowledge of or um, know anyone who is trans. And I thought 80% of people. They don't know that they know someone. Don't know that. that okay. Thank you. That's, that's mm -hmm. much better, Kristen. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they did, they did talk about a, um, a uh, documentary, um, I think it was called Disclosure. Um, I have not seen it, but I am I am going to make it um, my mission to watch that in the next few days. So I was, I, I don't know if you wanna enlighten us on any of that. Sure, so there, there are two things that are out right now that I would recommend. I actually was on a panel with a friend of mine yesterday who produced both of these. Um, Alex Schmitter, amazing human being um, and works for GLAAD. Um, so Alex produced Disclosure, which is on Netflix. I just put that in the in the chat, uh, and that is a it's a documentary about the history of trans representation in media. Laverne Cox is fe featured hev heavily from Orange Is the New Black. Laverne is amazing. Um, it's that that is absolutely worth watching. The other thing I would say is Changing the Game. I put this in the chat too. Changing the Game is on Hulu, and that is a story of a trans wrestler in high school um, who is forced to compete against the girls. It's a trans man. So he's forced to compete against girls, which isn't good for anyone. No one enjoys that. And, and the story of him, his family, um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful story. So I would watch those. I think it'll, it'll take a lot away from them. I know I did. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting how this time in the pandemic has allowed us all to, it, you'd be more introspective and learn more things from the comfort of our own home. And then we can bring it to places like this and ask these kinds of questions and with appreciation to the three of you for allowing the questions to come forward. Um, just, I remember in the eighties um, being a brand new laboratory technologist and learning about at AIDS and the virus as it was coming. And then thinking back to my high school and uh, junior high days even and thinking, oh my gosh, I now realize this person, that person, and how do I um, approach them now? And how do I get those questions that I had back in the day answered? So this is very um, helpful toward all that. And one of the programs that I have attended uh, from PPF it was called your uh, In the Center. And I'd ask, like to ask Tiffany, oh, maybe Tiffany wasn't here when that was happening. Uh, I'd like to ask about programs that you have and do you plan on continuing that particular one because I found it so extremely valuable and it was called, explain what it is, please. Sure. So uh, Tiffany wasn't so here yet. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, unfortunately. But I, I'll also link, we have those up on our, our website. Um, we did three of them. So 
in the center, we started, um, it, the idea was to center black voices. We were going to do one panel uh, session centering black voices. And uh, after that event, we thought, gosh, we should, we should do a number of these. So the first one was about centering black LGBTQ plus voices. The second one was a panel of, you know, local folk centering women's voices in the movement. And then the third one we did was around World AIDS Day and we centered the voices of those um, who are HIV impacted. So that, yeah, I think those are great. I'll, they were all really good. So I'll put the link. Uh, the plan was not to continue them because hopefully we'll be in person and we'll be able to do more of this stuff in person. Yeah. That's awesome. Maybe we could ask Tiffany to, even though you're brand new, give us a little hint or a little glimpse of what your dreams for, for Pacific Pride are with regard to programming and your position in the community. Yeah, so um, I want to see our youth program stuff expand. Um, and that could look like a number of things that could look like um, really working with um, having like a massive, well, not a massive, but a pretty big um, youth conference, um, doing more with youth, par with parents. Um, I, I would really like, one of my jobs, I worked for St. Paul Public Schools and I worked a lot with the parents and they were phenomenal. Um, and I worked a lot with the high schoolers who were also phenomenal. They actually put on a, a prom in a month on a budget of $200. It was, the, I, I'm very proud of that moment that they did that. So um, wanting to expand our youth programming for sure. We, we really do want to expand counseling. And I think that's, that's definitely going to be needed because as people, as we continue to see more light in the pandemic, uh, mental health issues are, are still going to be a problem. And at least now we're, I'd say we're getting more comfortable as a society talking about them because so many people are coming out that they have issues, but mm -hmm. we're still lacking resources. And so um, I'm looking forward to expanding that program as well. Um, and again, just really um, making sure that we could be the go-to organization even more so when it comes to harm reduction and especially with HIV testing and, and hep C testing. And so um, I'm really using the, my first year to kind of learn everything and think about what could be the grand dream of what this could look like, what that could look like. Because um, mm -hmm. the goal would be to expand, to add more people and even and expanding into a bigger building, but just to be like the Mecca of services, um, maybe even on a global scale. I like to dream big. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's good. They like big dreamers. Hey Tyson, a little little something personal from you. Was it was it a uh, hard decision to transition from board member to development director? Uh, no, because I was really excited to work with Kristen. I'll be honest. I, I think that we are very fortunate to have her, and I'm really excited to see. I mean, I've been working with her on the board now for a year, and you know, just watching her in action and listening to her vision for where she wants to take PPF. I'm very much aligned with that. And I was excited to do this. It feels like a great opportunity and it feels good being back in this line of work. Um, I'm really excited about it. Yeah. And what are your big dreams? What's your vision? <laughs> I guess to raise all the money for Tiffany's dream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good answer, good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Oh my God, that's a super awesome answer. Oh my goodness. Um, it has been a wonderful almost hour. I hate to say that. I mean, we, we said it when we first met, the hour is going to go very quickly. Uh, one thing that we like to do at the end of each hour, we want to give enough time for each of you to answer our one uh, question is touchstone topics is a, is something that uh, Emily and I've been doing that gives us a chance and offer to an audience things that we don't have necessarily an expertise on um, and and we do have curiosity and we do have questions and we want to offer a space for people to um, find those so thank you all for being those uh, people and being in this space we'd like to ask you each if you would honor us with an answer to this question, what is you, what does leading with love mean to you? Tiffany Tyson, you all go first. Okay, I'll go first. Um, so when I think of leading with love, I think of doing something bigger than yourself. That's 
kind of how mm-hmm. I approach my work is um, something that's bigger than me. Um, I've always wanted to do have a career helping people and it's shifted from wanting to be a doctor to now being um, helping my community. Um, so I, so that's what I think about is doing something that's bigger than myself and uh, doing stuff, um, being selfless. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, selfless intention, you know, doing something because it's the right thing to do and doing it even when it's hard and it's scary and it's uncomfortable and you just don't want to do it, but you know you have to and you do it anyway. Or something, yeah, bigger, something bigger than yourself, something bigger than your ego. Yeah. So I'll tell you a little, little story um, for this one. So I remember being a young, I don't know, lesbian activist. I don't know if I was an activist yet, but I went to one of my first pride events in Portland, Oregon in the 90s. And I'm in college and there with my friends, very exciting. It's like technicolor everywhere. And at the time, the Westboro Baptist Church, um, the folks who protest, you know, they were protesting uh, soldier deaths um, with terrible, terrible signs. They were at the time protesting everything gay with signs, that, you know, God hates that, hates bags. That was their website. That was their slogan. They would show up these huge signs en masse and chant God hates bags in this moment of joy. And I remember seeing that and thinking, uh, you know, what, what, what do we do? You know, what do we do? I, I don't back down from confrontation. And my instinct was to confront. And as I was standing there watching them yelling, um, a group of drag queens in all their fabulosity with caftans and scarves and platform shoes and beehive wigs walked up to them. And I thought, oh, no. But they surrounded the protesters in a circle and they started chanting. And they started chanting, we love you. And God hates fags was drowned out by this group of people on the margins yelling, we love you. So when I try, you know, there are moments when it's easy to lead with love. And those are great moments. But there are often times when it is not easy to lead with love. And in those moments, I think about the drag queens and I think about, you know, finding the other way. I didn't see that other way at the moment. They taught me another way. And so I, I think about them and I try to find that other way. Oh, once again, this has happened more than once, Emily and I, somebody gets us right there and we appreciate that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you all have left us speechless and that's hard to do. <laughs> We're very rarely left without words. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah. Oh, yes. if yeah. we are here for uh, to serve uh, Pacific Pride in any way that we can, uh, me personally, I'm I'm here to help. Um, I'm curious to know one one final thing. Um, what's your connection with LA and San Francisco? I know that you're the biggest presence on the Central Coast, and I know those two are big hubs of LGBTQ and Christian. You have a lot of experience in the South. So how can we make sure that it's one whole California that um, supports um, pride. Yeah, so I have I have connections in both places because of AIDS life cycle and the work that I did when I was there. So we worked with the San Francisco, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, which is a you know large presence um, in San Francisco and with um, the LGBT Center in LA, still work with them, um, still have lots of connections there, probably on a weekly basis. I'm saying to my, my program team or any of my team, hey, do you know so-and-so? Let me connect you. Um, and so we are constantly connecting and saying, we don't know how to do X, Y, Z with syringe exchange. Great, let's talk to San Francisco AIDS Foundation. They're on the cutting edge. We want to expand our seniors program and we're not sure how. Great, let me connect you with the center in LA or with Centerlink. I mean, it's not even California, it's Mm -hmm. nationwide. We have this incredible connection with 270 different LGBT centers across the world. And I get on a call week and, and talk with executive directors and we exchange information. So we are all really committed to being open source um, in our ethos and to sharing and making our community strong as a whole. That's fantastic. Well, 
I um, have followed you on um, a social media and I'm committing now to uh, receive your email newsletter because I haven't done that. I've gone to your website many times. So I'm going to do that today. Um, thank you, says one of our guests today. So grateful for your candor. Um, uh, as we end today, Emily and I always like to remind people that Touchstone Topics is something that we, we designed and just brought forth from our heart, and this is why we do it. Um, everybody on the call will be part of our, our newsletter, and um, our website is www.touchstonecc.com. And we like to have people like and share and love us on Facebook and social media at Touchstone Central Coast. So with that, it is 12.59 and just a second after. And we appreciate everybody here, everybody on the call, and especially Tyson, Kristen, and welcome to the Central Coast, Tiffany. We're so glad you're here. Thank you, everybody. And uh, one thing I came across is uh, when you reduce life to black and white, you'd never see the rainbow. Oh. Thank you very much for being here with us and spending this, this time and um, uh, for all the resources. Yeah. And to those of you who were on the call, um, the webinar to knowing, uh, you know, that there's options for supporting and, and how to make things um, better um, by being better ourselves. So thank you guys so much.